My name is Harish Viswanathan. I'm head of the radio systems research at Nokia Bell Labs. I'm based in uh, uh, New Providence uh, in New Jersey, uh, part of the uh, Nokia um, based in uh, Finland. So uh, as you all uh, probably know, the cellular industry introduces a new generation every 10 years or so. And subsequent to 5G, we expect the 6G to be uh, commercialized in the time frame of 2030. The research for 6G has already started uh, in many parts of the world, uh, in many companies, including at Nokia. And what I would like to do uh, today is to share uh, the vision for 6G that we at uh, Bell Labs have conceived and uh, describe a little bit about the research that we are doing there, uh, focusing on 6G. In order to understand what 6G would be about, I would like to start with uh, the, uh, the, the historical perspective of uh, cellular systems. 2G was introduced in the 1990s and was really focused around voice. So voice was the primary application. We shifted from analog voice to digital voice. And then if you look at what happened in 3G, it really had two main uh, purposes. One was voice capacity. So it was all about optimizing voice, making voice lower cost, and then introducing broadband data. But broadband data really did not take off until 4G. There was not enough capacity in 3G when the iPhone was introduced. So it was really 4G that optimized data. And by the middle of 4G, voice was essentially free. In other words, the marginal cost of voice was free. Voice was bundled with data in most parts of the world. So 4G was about optimizing data, but then 4G introduced itself new use cases. Uh, the machine type communication uh, like LTEM and narrowband IoT were introduced in 4G and video streaming became a very popular use case in 4G enabled by the higher throughputs and the lower latencies of 4G. Now we look to 5G which is starting to be deployed and we can predict that 5G was, is going to optimize the use cases of 4G such as optimize the video even more, get better, higher quality video, optimize IoT. And the new use cases of 5G are the industrial internet of things. The ultra reliable low latency communications has been introduced in 5G for the first time. And the other new use cases, the consumer focused use cases is going to be the interactive video and the augmented reality. So more and more we are likely to use 5G for video conferencing like this, maybe even more advanced video conferencing with augmented reality. So what you see here is a pattern. Each new generation is about optimizing the use case of the previous generation, making it lower cost, uh, making it essentially uh, unlimited in terms of the service, and then also introduce new use cases. Following that trend, we sort of predict that 6G is going to have at least two different uh, focus areas. One would be to optimize the industrial IoT. Industrial IoT is, is about the application of 5G to verticals, such as uh, mining, um, factories, hospitals, et cetera, right? So then 6G is about really making that more widespread by reducing the cost of such industrial IoT services. At the same time, the, the, the use cases of the previous generations are going to become uh, essentially zero marginal cost. You will pay for access, but then everything comes with it unlimited. And what about the new use cases of 6G? So when it comes to the new use cases of 6G, we believe it will be about what we call the dynamic digital worlds, which I'll talk about next, as well as AI and sensing. So what is the dynamic digital world? Okay, so if you want to think about that, the way we think about it is that it is, it's about unleashing the human potential and well-being while being sustainable and at scale. So we think of 6G as really enabling three different categories of use cases. The first one is enriching the human experience. While we introduce augmented reality in 5G, that will be taken to the next level in 6G. 
we will have rich representations of entire digital worlds in uh, entire uh, digital representation of entire physical worlds in the digital world with high resolution multi sensory experiences this is what we mean by the dynamic digital worlds it's in it's in real time both spatially uh, in real time and in every spatial uh, location and every time in space. so how do we achieve that with, with use cases like high resolution mapping so you can imagine vehicles uh, of the 2030s and now we are talking about 2030 to 2040 which is the time when 6g is going to be prevalent a lot of vehicles will have a lot of sensors cameras lidar systems that are capturing essentially their view of of where they are and all of this data can be sent back to the cloud and the entire environment can be reconstructed by piecing together all these different uh, data that's coming from various sources it could also be cameras deployed in cities um sensing or deployed uh in various uh, uh base stations or other sensing systems another application example of the dig dynamic digital world would be multimodal telepresence to be able to appear anywhere in any way that you want you could be in a car but essentially appear to others like you are in an office uh, environment and some people even talk about holographic telepresence you know 3d representation of you uh in a, in a in a conference like this uh we we will all potentially be able to uh, imagine that we are in a conference room setting although we are in different places and digital core design is up, using these digital worlds in a factory context so you can imagine the two different uh factory uh, workers in two different locations being able to design new products together including both physical and virtual objects so the entire workbench is captured at high resolution and shared across to the other other person the other uh, employee and they're able to uh, manipulate these objects both physical objects and virtual objects so those are the kinds of rich digital experiences uh, that we uh, envision for the future the second category of use cases would be augmenting human intelligence so we all believe that ai will become more and more prevalent in the future we may have more advanced digital assistance in the us we we talk about alexa the google home all kinds of digital assistants are already there and natural language processing is becoming more advanced and you can imagine that this is going to progress further and we will use machines uh for not just uh doing things that we ask them but also gather intelligence from the machines they they augment our uh, human intelligence by providing us with the right information filtering the right uh data and turning that into useful information for us of course all of this has to be done with high security and privacy um and and we believe that the uh, future use cases will all be driven by that as well additional way of uh, enhancing our intelligence is through uh monitoring of what is happening to us uh in body using new types of sensors as well as uh, learning about our emotions and capturing that in the digital world so the digital world also includes representation of humans and the last one is about enhancing human productivity so here we are talking about using robots so you can imagine in the next 10 to 20 years there will be many more robots and cooperative robots robots that would have to interact with each other and so communications will be an essential piece of the of the solution or it could be in the form of remote and self driving self driving in cities is still going to remain a target distant target but remote driving is very much possible like we uh, like we have uh, drone pilots today for the army and, uh, and air force uh, we could potentially imagine uh, general public being able to remotely manage some of the vehicles or it could be drone uh, swarms that uh, interact with each other all all designed to uh, enhance human productivity so what we are thinking about the future is that it humans will not only inhabit the physical world but will also be essentially a part of the digital world and the human world and the physical world and the digital world will all be blended together through real time communications and you will not uh, you will experience uh, all of this uh 
in a homogeneous way. And that will help unleash the, the potential of, uh, of uh, human beings and their uh, ability to, to, to experience the world. Okay, so all of that is very visionary. So I want to also talk a little bit about what is the transition from 5G? A lot of people always ask, okay, how is 6G really going to be different from 5G? Now, thinking a little bit more about the technology as well, not just these uh, use cases. How is the network going to be different? How is the air interface going to be different? So here are some ways that we believe uh, we will we'll see some differences. So first one is again, addressing the use cases, which I already talked about. And so I'll just uh, say that the way we get from 5G use cases to 6G use cases is to increase the capacity of the network. So we really need to have higher capacity in a wide area context and extreme MIMO, going beyond the massive MIMO of 5G would be one way to achieve that. And I'll talk about that uh, more later. In terms of control applications, 5G supports remote monitoring and guidance, whereas uh, 6G can be enhanced. I mean, 6G will be uh, able to support remote control, real-time control. And that's what I think we should work towards. And what we need here is higher reliability outdoors. So if you want to control vehicles, uh, then you, you really have to have high outdoor reliability uh, with lower latencies. And wide band ca bandwidth carriers are one way to uh, achieve this higher uh, reliable, reliability. Generally, coverage is non-uniform in the sense that we don't have very good coverage in rural areas or over oceans, but we really like our communications to be seamlessly available everywhere. And so we have to shoot for global coverage in the 2030s. And interoperability or integration with non-terrestrial networks would be an essential feature of the future networks that enable the sort of true global coverage. Spectrum sharing is also important, uh, spectrum and RAN sharing to reduce cost of the network in rural areas, et cetera. In 4G, 5G, we talk about self-optimizing networks. I think this will evolve to truly zero touch automation uh, with no involvement of the human in the loop, driven by advances in machine learning and artificial intelligence. We can do things like root cause analysis and uh, understand what needs to be modified in the network and automate all of that. And energy efficiency is going to be a critical piece of the, of the uh, future network. We have to be able to uh, ensure that uh, the new network uh, is as energy efficient as possible and optimizing the network for energy efficiency would be an important feature. If you look at the network architecture, how it's being deployed, 5G is evolving towards cloud native. Cloud native meaning uh, microservices in edge clouds or far edge clouds is, is what is expected in 5G in terms of future deployments. And if you look at where that's going next, it's going to go towards much more heterogeneous cloud. So the cloud could be a public cloud like an Amazon cloud or a Google cloud, or it could be a, a private cloud by, with, with a network operator, or it could be an enterprise cloud. So we need to be able to deploy the network in a very heterogeneous cloud interconnected by some sort of uh, uh, information bus that allows uh, very quick and open uh, exchange of information between the different functions. And, and the fact that the RAN is moving closer to the, uh, or moving to the cloud and the core is coming closer to the edge gives us an opportunity for further simplification of the network, architecture simplification and specialization, remove duplication of functionality. So, and, and of course, automation and Capability discovery are important aspects of this to allow to make the, the network truly microservices based with many small functions. You need more automation uh, to deploy and maintain the network. And security, of course, is a, has always been an important feature in for, uh, in cellular systems, 4G, 5G. We go to trustworthy and resilient systems uh, in the future. Meaning the as the network evolves to multi-vendor networks, we are able to trust the software that comes from uh, any vendor and the network remains resilient, independent of uh, uh, sudden disasters, et cetera. And then focusing on the, uh, on the campus uh, sort of uh, environment, uh, the URLC, as I said before, we expect the URLC to become much more efficient. 
So main feature would be higher efficiency, lower cost, reduce the number of access points that need to be deployed to achieve you know, the millisecond latency or maybe a couple of milliseconds latency. And the way we can do this is exploit more information about the uh, scenario with the digital twin of a factory, for example. We can uh, make use of information about robots, how they move, where the machines are, and then optimize the connectivity based on uh, such knowledge. Another aspect of this would be to exploit uh, core design of communication and control, especially to achieve very low latencies. With respect to IoT, we are likely to see a new class of applications with zero energy devices potentially using backscatter like communications. Today, it's possible to do that with RFID tags, but then the range is very limited. We have an opportunity to increase the range with uh, more advanced uh, 6G uh, beamforming and uh, other kinds of uh, innovations. And then localization is a characteristic of 5G, 5G advanced. We are down to 25 centimeter accuracy now. And the next step in that evolution would be to enable sensing capabilities uh, in 6G. So designed for joint communication and sensing, uh, again, with wider bandwidth carriers that support that. Okay, so I gave you a, a sort of a tour of where we are going from 5G to 6G. Now focusing a bit more on the technologies, we sort of see six key technology areas for 6G. So starting from here, new spectrum technologies. This refers to the uh, technologies that are needed to exploit new spectrum, either in the new mid bands or in the sub terahertz frequencies. So these are some of the new frequencies that we expect. Yes, yes please, Professor. Have, yes. You move any, have you moved any slides? Because uh, from the beginning, we only see one slide. So if I don't know oh. if you have moved any slide or not. I have quite a few slides. I've been advancing my slide. Sorry, I don't know why you're not seeing that. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I, you should have mentioned that before. Uh, and yeah. I don't, I, I've gone through five or six slides already. Yeah, okay. Is it better now? Are you able to see it? Yes, it's a new one. So you saw this one? Yeah, this one. Okay, and it, then I showed you this one. Yeah, it's small now. Okay, I showed this slide. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, uh, and then I showed this slide on the different types of categories of use cases and then the physical, digital, and human worlds. Yeah. Right. And then I showed these, uh, these uh, 6G, the moving from 5G to 6G. Uh, okay, so let me try to do slideshow again and hope that it, it, it works. Uh, yeah. Are you now seeing slide number seven? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. I didn't realize that my slides were not advancing. So okay. hopefully it was still somewhat meaningful. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> let, let me continue. Uh, so yes, I was just speaking about the new spectrum technologies. Uh, the next one, next important technology area for us is um, AI native ad interface. So this is the use of machine learning to design the new ad interface that can adapt to the environment uh, and exploit uh, machine learning to do joint optimization across different functions. We believe that that will give us some benefits uh, over traditional uh, 4G, 5G, OFTM like ad interfaces. So you can almost think of this as the new OFTM of the future designed by machine learning. Network as a sensor, as I, as I explained, is about the joint uh, design of communications and sensing or integrated design of communications and sensing. And there are a number of new research issues that come up. Uh, extreme connectivity is about the optimization for low latency and high reliability. Uh, as I said, one key aspect is to optimize the 6G for lower cost, ultra reliable, low latency communication. And then the architecture enhancements are basically captured here. Uh, many different ideas on how we can improve the network architecture in the time frame of 6G. And finally, new solutions are needed for security and trust. In the new uh, paradigm, we need um, uh, much more privacy 
to make sure that we don't inadvertently share uh, things that we, we do not want to share, right? I'm here, I'm sharing my video, but maybe I don't really want to share some other things. Uh, so how can you automate uh, what I want to share and what I don't want to share? And also trust, trust that the network uh, is not doing something that it's not expected to do. So these are the key six technologies that I will be talking about in the remaining uh, 20 minutes or so. Okay, is my slide advancing now? I see, are you able to see, see slide eight? Or is it still slide seven? Are you all able to see slide eight, anyone? Yes, yes, please move okay. on. Okay, thanks. Okay, so now about spectrum. Um, so what you see on the screen now is the 4G uh, spectrum and 5G spectrum, which will of course also be refound for 6G. So we have the lower bands and the mid bands going up to seven gigahertz in some countries. But where is the new spectrum for 6G? Every new generation has to come with new spectrum. So there are two places where we think 6G might get really new spectrum. One is in the sub terahertz. The W band looks promising. And there's a lot of spectrum in the D band, some of which could easily be made available for mobile communications. However, this band is not that, that suitable for wide area uh, cellular because propagation in these bands are very difficult. Uh, especially non line of sight, and we can only achieve very small cells. So what we really need for 6G is new spectrum in the new mid bands. The, the band from seven to 15 gigahertz or seven to 20 gigahertz has uh, potentially pockets of spectrum that could be provided for mobile communications. And, and that band would be the new sweet spot for 6G just like the three and a half gigahertz to five or six gigahertz is the new sweet spot for 5G. We expect some new spectrum in the seven to 12 or seven to 15 gigahertz to be the new sweet spot for uh, 6G. Without such new spectrum, with more, uh, without such new spectrum and wider band carriers, you know, it's very difficult to make a new generation uh, successful. So I think all, all of the, ecosystem players have to talk to their respective uh, regulators to ensure that some kind of spectrum in this band becomes available for 60. And of course, there will be some uh, spectrum that's made available in the low, very low bands that can be used for IoT in the 1.5 gigahertz bands. So how do we make use of the new mid band? What can we expect to achieve with the new mid band, right? So our, this is where the extreme MIMO comes into the picture. So in 5G, we are deploying systems with about 256 radiators, 256 antenna elements, and bandwidths ranging from 100 to 160 megahertz. And these are typically 64 TRX uh, systems. And if you look at the dimensions, it's about 37 centimeters by 70 centimeters, right? Now that's the size of the antenna that can go on a tower without major difficulty. And so we want to meet, keep the same cell sites because we want to avoid densification because densification is expensive. And at the same time, we want to um, uh, increase the capacity. So going to higher frequencies, like so if you, if you compare three and a half and seven, we are doubling the frequency. That essentially allows us to quadruple the number of antennas. So you can pack as, as many as four times the number of antennas here in the same 37 by 71 centimeters and keep the same lambda by two spacing between the elements. So essentially now we have a much larger antenna array system to do massive MIMO. And the challenge for us is how do we actually build cost-effective systems with such higher number of antenna elements and higher number of transceivers? So we will need highly uh, scalable MIMO system. And the one path to achieving that is through hybrid beamforming. So we need new beamforming innovations, beamforming implemented on the antenna surface, partially digital, partially analog, because all digital would be too expensive in terms of 
cost and power consumption because of a large number of antenna elements. And we need flexibility because all, all uh, deployments will not be in the same band, will not have the same number of antennas, same bandwidth. So we need to be very flexible in our MIMO system. So the radio or transceiver needs to be highly flexible. And we need uh, advanced uh, algorithms uh, to support the increase in spectral efficiency. So we are predicting that with four times bandwidth, so going from 100 to 400 megahertz and getting a five times spectral efficiency, we can get 20x improvement in cell capacity. The artificial intelligence ad interface, a very interesting new topic, a lot of research potential. What you see here is the classical communication system in the physical layer. You have various functional blocks such as medium access, error correction, modulation, and, and the receiver blocks. What we're already doing in 5G now starting to do is to replace these individual blocks with potentially uh, deep learning based uh, approaches. Algorithms that are designed using machine learning techniques for better performance or better uh, reduced uh, complexity. And this we can do now already in 5G, 5G advanced with no changes in the standards. But where we would really like to go is combine multiple such functions into one single functional block uh, designed using machine learning. And the benefit of this is joint optimization across multiple functional blocks. You know, today we are not able to do any kind of joint or iterative processing because it gets too complicated and the structure is difficult to implement. Whereas a homogeneous uh, neural network like structure can potentially do joint optimization across uh, multiple such uh, functional blocks. And that shows that uh, it improves performance, especially for harder, harder scenarios like higher vehicle speed or more multipath, more Doppler. These are the kinds of scenarios where the machine learning seems to outperform uh, human designed uh, algorithms. So we are very hopeful that, you know, we, we will find new new designs for our AR interface uh, based on this. So on the transmit side, it could be uh, ideas such as uh, waveform learning uh, to adapt the OFTM waveform to operate in the nonlinear uh, settings, uh, driving the PA into nonlinear settings to increase the energy efficiency, for example. Okay, so here's a little example of what I'm just talking about. So we've uh, done some studies on end-to-end -end learning. On the transmit side, we design constellations that are non-traditional using machine learning, non-symmetric, uh, and then use time domain uh, convolutional networks for preparing the, the input to drive the PA into the nonlinear regime. And then on the received side, we have one single uh, deep RX, what we call deep RX uh, or the receive side network to generate the log likelihood ratios. And with this, we are able to achieve better performance, better energy efficiency. Uh, for example, we can eliminate pilots uh, because the, the, the receiver can learn the pilots by using the, the fact that these constellations are in specific, uh, uh, has a specific structure. Sorry. Went to the wrong side. Okay, so then moving on, um, the new topic, another new topic for 6G would be uh, the joint communications and sensing. The basic idea is that we are going to wider bandwidths, and we have already MIMO in our systems, beam forming. So we should be able to use that to generate uh, radar-like. Uh, maps, radar maps of the environment from the base station. So using the same o, uh, OFDM signal, for example, with OFDM radar principles, we can create um, radar maps, which can then be used for many different applications. It could be used for ranging, velocity estimation. It could be used for uh, imaging in the case of very high bandwidths. It could be medical imaging, or it could be for other applications such as traffic sensing, traffic control, uh, parking lot identification in the wide area context, or around the corner detection of objects. These kinds of uh, uh, sensing applications uh, become possible because the, the cellular system becomes more, more wider bandwidth, 
we get better resolution in the range, right? Uh, the la larger the bandwidth, the finer the time resolution with which we can estimate the delay in the reflected signal. And that allows us to estimate the range uh, better. And also it gives us a lot of new research problems to, to consider. So do we need a spe separate special waveform for sensing or is OFTM also good for sensing? And how do we opportunistically use uh, the resources for both sensing and for communication? So when you're scanning for, uh, say, the SSB beams in 5G, for example, you sweep beam, beam sweeping to, to determine what the best beam is to send to a particular device. The same beam sweeping can also be used for uh, sensing at the same time. You, of course, need full duplex capability uh, which can be achieved by having a, a separate uh, snooper receiver. So, and then we can use the pilot signals that are available as, uh, as more, uh, providing more information um, for, for uh, sensing. So all in all, there's a lot of synergy between designing for communications and designing for sensing. And we want to be able to reuse the same hardware, reuse the same spectrum and uh, try to do the best possible radar uh, maps that acquire the best possible radar maps from every cell site. So it's democratizing the sensing. Imagine the way we are able to do now communications from anywhere. If every cell site can do sensing, we can create a lot of new applications potentially. So that's, I, I think, something that could happen in 6G, maybe especially starting from the indoor context and then going to outdoors eventually. Uh, another uh, new idea that we are working on is how to enable a lot of small networks, what we call the index uh, networks. The basic idea is that uh, more and more 6G is going to be applied to verticals, many different use cases. And some of these could be things like in-car networks or robot area networks. Now the air interface here uh, may be somewhat different from the wide area air interface. Uh, but the thing is that it would be good to have a connection to the 6G network from each of these networks. And maintaining state about the network, the set of devices in the main network enables uh, ensuring good quality of service to these devices. Uh, also managing interference between such networks uh, and mobility between networks. These things are all facilitated by the wide area network. So this is another uh, concept that we think would be uh, something that uh, that 6G could explore. And already is happening in 5G. If you look at the URL LC use cases with for time sensitive networking, uh, there is typically a network behind the 5G device, uh, which the 5G network is serving. Architecture enhancements. There are quite a few things that we are thinking about in terms of uh, improving the architecture. I talked about the heterogeneous cloud uh, deployments. So this is the idea that we should prepare our networks to be deployed in any kind of computing uh, environment. It could be a, a private cloud, hybrid cloud, or a public cloud. Uh, and it has to be programmable network, highly flexible. Uh, optimize the function placement depending on the slice or the use case, et cetera. Another key theme we have is uh, what is called the RAN core unification. So this is the idea that the RAN is starting to become more and more uh, deployed in the cloud, especially the higher layers of the RAN are being deployed in the edge clouds. At the same time, the core functions of the mobile network are moving closer to the edge, edge to handle the scalability. Right. The more traffic you want to carry in the network, the more of these core network routers you need, like the UPF functions. And so the RAN and the core are sort of meeting at the edge. And so many functions uh, can be integrated into a single RAN core function to avoid duplication. And that gives us a, a lower cost, more energy efficient network potentially. So that's something that we've been working on and this also means uh, introducing the service-based architecture within the RAN. So interfaces between the microservices are services-based. 
Another very important aspect of the 6G architecture would be what we call the cognitive networking. So this includes uh, uh, the self-organizing networks or network automation using machine learning to understand how the network must be configured for any particular deployment, uh, adapting the network to the traffic patterns uh, and, and use cases along those lines. Network automation includes, uh, you know, new management and orchestration uh, service, service level uh, orchestration, end-to-end -end, uh, multi-domain orchestration, these kinds of uh, uh, concepts, uh, and int intent-based network management. So the service provider basically provides intents and the, the network fi figures out itself how to do the management. Uh, across the different parts of the network, the transport network, the, uh, the uh, radio part, and the core network part, et cetera. And then we also need uh, the data and information architecture uh, for moving the information of needed for machine learning. So machine learning becomes a service that's also consumed by the network itself, but also made available to other applications. So it could in include data collection, uh, various distributed learning techniques like federated learning, uh, and then pushing the model back into the uh, particular device. The model has to be adapted to different hardware uh, configurations, uh, and then maintaining the history of what uh, sort of model adapt adaptations have been done, uh, what the training data was has to be stored, these kinds of things are what is called generally the machine learning as a service. And we expect that the mobile network to support machine learning as a service. Uh, deep slicing refers to the next level of slicing evolution where since uh, these are microservices in the cloud, then each slice could have its own customized uh, application or, or software that's optimized for the specific applications carried in the slice. For example, if you have a, a video service, a specialized video service, uh, like, uh, you know, XR, AR type service, then you could have optimization on a scheduler that's optimized for that particular service uh, as a microservice deployed. And so slicing is not only about resource reservation, but could also be about specific types of software uh, in, instantiated for optimizing that particular slice. We already talked about the 6G subnetworks, the idea of having a state maintained both in the main network as well as in the smaller subnetworks um, and doing interference management, et cetera. And then the last idea would be to explore uh, cell-less or distributed MIMO mesh type service for uh, resilience. Okay, and then uh, moving on to the last aspect here on security and trust. The basic idea is there are now many more threat vectors that are likely in the 6G because of, of course, lots of endpoints, billions of endpoints, but now also millions of networks, because as I said, every device, uh, I mean, a lot of devices might have a whole network of other devices behind that uh, cellular connected device. So we're really talking about many small networks, which then increases the potential for uh, attack, the attack surface increases essentially. And then we have more in open interfaces and disaggregation in the network. The transparency is good, but it also opens the network for more attacks. Uh, and the fact that the ownership is not anymore just uh, the service provider. So the ownership of hardware is separate from the ownership of software. Uh, the ownership of service might be separate from that of software. So with multiple parties involved, uh, again, there's potential for more complexity in the security. So we are working on many different uh, technology areas to, to support uh, uh, the new needs of security. You know, quantum safe cryptography is an essential piece because quantum uh, computing may catch up. And so our systems have to be secure against quantum attacks. <clears throat> we need new privacy techniques, uh, better authentication mechanisms, audit mechanisms, et cetera. And machine learning, again, can play a very important role in analyzing data, uh, in securing the various operation uh, and uh, trust in trust because it can uh, verify uh, software authenticity and things like that. Okay, so 
with that, I'm coming to my conclusion. So in terms of when we think 6G will happen, we believe that um, 3GPP will still be the 6G uh, standardization body. I think there will be a study item around 2025 leading to the first uh, 60 specifications sometime in 27 or 28 with the commercial products available by 2030. Uh, and the work in ITU is already beginning now. Uh, I think in 22, now we, we are submitting to ITU on the vision workshop and things like that. And in 23, there will be bandwidth uh, or spectrum allocation proposals in the first world radio conference of this uh, decade and going to 27 for finalizing the bands. That is kind of the timeline that we're working towards from concept research to requirements to specifications. In terms of the research uh, that's going on today, there's already a lot of research that's ongoing. We have uh, the next G Alliance and rings in North America. These are government or maybe not government, but at least uh, uh, standardization like bodies, uh, ecosystem, um, organizations that are driving the 6G research in various uh, countries, right? Uh, we have some activity already in North America. We have a lot of activity in uh, Europe uh, and many more also in China. The MIIT organizes the IMT 2030 forum, uh, as well as other things that are happening in China. Likewise, in Japan, they have the Ministry of uh, Communications, um, Internal Affairs and Communications that work on white papers. A lot of these uh, organizations are producing 6G white papers that are publicly available. And, and the whole idea is to build consensus about what 6G will be and start doing some early demonstrations and things like that. Okay, with that, I will come to my uh, uh, end of my presentation. So the main takeaways are 6G is about new use cases. It's about connecting the worlds. Uh, we will have very, interesting dynamic digital worlds and you will have homogeneous experience across digital physical and human worlds 6g will have much more capacity and more synchronous communications to create these sorts of uh, multiple world experiences and 6g will be a, a really a trusted platform with uh, with sensing capability embedded in the system so with that i will uh, conclude my presentation Thank you so much for your attention.